Good morning, it is 4.36 on a Friday, and here I am in bed again. i got to stop doing this. For several weeks now, I've been waking up about 4, 4.30 a.m. every morning. My circadian rhythms are definitely off. I get really, really sleepy around 8, 8.30 p.m., and usually in bed by 9, 9.30 and I've been sleeping actually really well this last week or two. Especially on vacation, I was sleeping pretty well on my road trip. But now I'd like to get my routine and schedule back. And we'll talk about that. We need to talk about sleep, insomnia, um, sleep hygiene, how to, how to get a better night's sleep how to get a night's sleep at all for those with chronic insomnia. This is something that really affects people with anxiety. And I know has affected me significantly over time. But today I want to talk a little more on boundaries. We mentioned this previously. And I'm talking about boundaries with our phone. Um, carrying off of our last topic a little bit. But... This one came up with me on the trip, and it's one I wanted to touch on because I purposely limited my access to my phone, or at least access to communication on my phone, if that makes sense, communication. And I have some policies that I follow and always have, and uh, ever since I started doing a podcast, of course, people would reach out to me, and those emails, whether they came through feedback forums on my website or through um, comments on YouTube or on you know third-party podcast carriers and such. I get a lot of correspondence. I wasn't on social media, or at least I was at the beginning, but I pulled back from that, so I wasn't getting a lot from like Facebook or anything else. But that could easily overtake my life, and I've always known that. I limit my phone and what my phone tells me. For a long time, I was just limiting having my phone with me. Um, I would go many places without my phone. I don't have a, a phone-connected watch of any kind. If I don't have a watch anymore, I stopped using that too. It was a way to separate myself from technology. I still carry my phone with me most of the places, um, in part because I like to track my notes uh, that I might use for the podcast or work or to-do lists or whatever. In part because it's a communications thing and I still use it for communications and for other reasons. We all do it. But I'm very conscious of being burdened. I listened to a podcast episode of another, um, provi another content creator and the guest was talking about how when we share too much of our lives online, and I touched on this previously, we don't have boundaries of how we share publicly. We lose intimacy. And I thought that was an interesting take because we lose intimacy both, I think we lose intimacy both with ourselves and with those close to us. My wife and I need to have a world that other people aren't exposed to. I don't need to share what my wife and I talk about or what we share with other people. The only time I share some things about that is with, number one, with her permission, and number two, if it's directly relevant to the content I'm providing. But since I don't have personal social media, which I don't, many people are probably cringing at that idea that... um I'm missing out on something. How can I do that? But I never established that significantly. I've been on Facebook. I've been on, um, I was never on Twitter before, although now I'm on Twitter or X for the podcast. Again, I don't have a personal account there. I was on Instagram for a little bit. Again, tied to the podcast. But I never really set myself up in that world. And so I never got used to having to post everything in my life. And maybe that's because 
I had a business outlet. I had a way to share what I was going through through the podcast and that maybe that was my outlet and I got feedback and so maybe that was my substitute. I'm not trying to take some high road here whatsoever because I know I could, it could as easily get sucked into that as anybody. But I have boundaries. Boundaries in life are so important. And not a boundary doesn't have to be something you are terrified of crossing or adamant or absolute every now and then our boundaries you know fall down or we step over them for a little while but boundaries are meant to be there so that most of the time you separate yourself from this it's a boundary you don't do this or you always do this with online with phones there's a lot of ways to do this I used to not even have my phone with my I come from an age I am of an age I come from a time without portable phones we had no device on us for communication yes I'm telling the old grandpa story around the <laughs> around the fireplace to the grandchildren but um, many of you are of my generation or older some of you are younger but I come from a time when we had no communication we carried around. My very first portable communication device was a bag phone. Back when cell phones were, I don't know, the size of a computer, almost. And I could plug it into the car and I could dial somebody directly. Um, and it would work a third of the time. You had to be in a very specific spot in the city for it to work. I thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> then we got more mobile phones with cellular towers, with flip phones, and then we got these smartphones that did so much more. So much more. And I am on my phone too much. I have fallen into that trap. I'm on it too much. Now, I'm not on social media or communicating too much, and I limit myself for that because I know what that does to me. On this vacation, I think I checked my email twice on this vacation road trip because it was part work and part vacation. But on this road trip of two and a half weeks, I checked my email twice. I let it be. And you know what? I don't think the world collapsed. What I did in advance is that I let people know especially colleagues of committees I was on and groups I work with, that if you had something urgent that needed my attention, text me. And they had my number to text me. And only a limited number of people have my phone number to text me. But I would have them text me. And I think only one person did one time when I had to jump on something. But that was it. They left me alone. So I did not check my email. Now, when I come home, I have a lot of emails to shift through, to sift through, not shift through, but sift through. But it took a huge, oh, it, it separated myself so much and it allowed me to be in the world I was in, which was on the road, traveling with my buddy, um, you know, going to different things, hiking in the forests in Tennessee and along the cliffs and seeing the waterfalls and maybe stopping and taking a picture of it. But guess what? I didn't post that anywhere. The pictures were for me. I did send a picture or two later back to my wife to show her where we'd been, but that was it. And then down to um, Florida and traveling around there and seeing theme parks and stuff, which is still one of my addictions. Although it's, after this last trip, it's definitely easing. I'm not feeling the desire to go down there nearly as much. And I think it's mostly age and my ability to do some of the rides and attractions. I've, I've aged myself out, I think, which is okay. But that separateness allowed me to be, well, what, what we call for those of us that meditate, um, being in the moment. That mindfulness, 
to be at that location, to be with my friend, to be seeing the sights of this country. And we still had some distractions going on. We would often listen to sports radio um, in the car because, you know, it's the NFL playoffs, so we're catching up with that and what's going on, and that's interesting. And we would, um, and when I drove home by myself, I would put on a book on tape. You know, on the road, it's good sometimes to have those distractions, but sometimes I would just have music in the background and I would, I would enjoy enjoy the scenery. But I'll admit, I have my phone with me most of the time now. This is a change, and I don't think it's also necessarily a change for the better. But there are so many ways, even if we have our phone with us all the time, we can control, we can set boundaries. One thing I've never done for a long time, I never had email on my phone. I now have access to email on my phone, but that's different than being notified of email on my phone. I'm amazed at the number of people who are notified by every email that comes in. And every social media post that comes in. And every alert tied with their, you know, 70 apps on their phone when they come in. Phones allow you to turn off notifications. At least the iPhone does, and I think the Android does, and other phones. And I go and do that. I check that all the time. I see when, you know, I, I limit what they when they can know my location, and I limit how often they can notify me on that home screen, on that close screen, whatever it is. But you know what I'm talking about when a little, you know, alert pops up. So I don't get notified by any email. I have a set time and have for a long, long time. I check my email usually in the morning at work. I find out where I'm at. And I take a look. And I respond to people and I send out emails and I check my email periodically throughout the day. Again, I don't get alerts on my computer when an email comes in. But when I go to Outlook, I use Outlook for tracking my emails. It's a Microsoft product on my computer. It'll tell me if I got new emails in my, in my you know, five or six different email boxes that I have, which I have several of them, and I get a lot of emails. I would say three quarters of them are junk, things I don't need to pay attention to. But a quarter of them are things that are things I do pay attention to and need to pay attention to. I don't check those emails when I'm at home with my wife in the evening or on the weekend. Maybe I, I used to. I was doing that a lot with work. I was doing I was check I was working seven days a week and have done that for years with my other podcasts and the committees and the research teams and on and everything like that. But that's one of the reasons I took a hiatus off in December. I don't respond to everybody that's communicated to me from the podcast. I can't anymore. There were too many. I was trying to respond to every email, and eventually I would get behind by 50 or 100 or more, and I could not keep up. And I love getting the correspondence, and I still try to see all the correspondence that comes in as much as possible. I might not see all of it, but I try to. But I can't keep up, and I have to let go of that and realize I won't respond to all the emails, and that's okay. But the phone can take over our lives. We see it everywhere. I think one of the most common things that I see and started to see, you know, five, ten years ago, but see it everywhere now is when you're supposed to be someplace else. You go out to dinner, and there's two people, maybe on a date, I don't know what it is, but, and they're both on their phones. The whole meal. They only put it down to take a bite, and then they're back on their phones, and they're right in front of each other. Only on occasion are they talking to each other. 
one of the biggest places I saw this on my trip was at the theme parks at Disney and Universal, which I go to. They've designed them now, especially Disney, to have your phone, to need your phone. Disney now has a system called Genie Plus, which you have to have your phone with you to log in to your next ride so you can try to skip the lines. If you pay for this, of course, it's another way to make more money, which that's a whole other topic for a different time. <laughs> but not only is everybody out there social media and Instagramming and taking photos and sending them off to their feeds and everything, now the theme parks on top of it are encouraging you to be on your phone while you're at a freaking theme park. It makes no sense. Why did you bother to go to the theme park if you're going to be on your phone the whole time you're there? Why do you bother to go hiking if every time that you turn a corner you're taking a picture of something and posting it and reading the comments that come back from it? Why do we bother to do anything in life in person when our primary focus is sharing that online with the world. Or at least with our friends who follow us. These phones have killed, in my opinion, which is an essential piece of a healthy life. And that is mindfulness of being in the moment. I'm not saying we can't still do it, and I'm not saying we can't still do it if you have a phone. I have a phone, and I'm trying to still find that balance, and I did on this road trip, and I still am while I'm at home. One of the values I was reminded of, this trip was, one of its focuses was on, you know, realizing how wonderful my life is back home. One of the values I picked up was how much I love to spend time with my wife, with my extended family, with our friends, and almost, I would say, 90% of my good friends I met in person. I met in person. There's a few good friends I met through the podcast. And I met, I actually met one of those um, on this trip. I met a couple on this trip. And I corresponded with another couple, a couple of those friends on this trip. Um, and I still communicate those with those individuals. But, and so many more when I get back to my email of my good friends that I've picked up along the way. But 90% of my friends are people who I've met in person and I met our neighbors here and we're getting together with some new neighbors who have a dog and boy dogs are wonderful I can just say wonderful for breaking down that barrier and meeting people and we're going over to watch the Chiefs football game this weekend at their house and let the dogs play there is another way to live and it doesn't have to be absolute. You don't have to throw your phone in the trash can. Although, I don't know, that's such a bad thing at times. And maybe I'll do that one day. And there's a way to live without having to be away from your phone all the time, or even most of the time. The question is, do you have the discipline to not let the phone control your life? And what this is about isn't just about your time, but it's about the emotions linked to it. When you hear that beep, mine's a train whistle right now, which is a text coming through. But we have all these different sounds that remind us that something's coming through. When you hear that, how fast do you pick up your phone? How fast do you look at it? How, how, how do you feel when you hear it? How do you feel when you see what it's from? Who's it? Who it's from? Does your heart drop? Because it's, oh, that person? 
Does your heart lift because you were wanting to hear from this person? Is it something you forgot to do and it's a reminder to now to go do that? As an emotional person, which I am especially post-benzodiazepines, my emotions go all over the place with an alert on my phone. I'm annoyed by them a lot of the time. And I purposely do not pick up my phone every time I hear something. I will come back to it later. It'll still be on that opening screen when I turn on my phone. And I will see it. And then I will decide whether to respond to it or not. But I don't have that instant reaction just to pick it up. And I think that's a good thing. But turning off your notifications, limiting what you're notified by, there are ways that are built into these phones to help us control how much they control our lives. And it's important, I believe, to do that for yourself, for your intimate relationships, so you keep that private, as I still do, and I mentioned in the last podcast about boundaries I have. Things I don't share, I don't share 98% of the things I talk with my wife about online. It's not appropriate in my mind. It's not necessary. I don't want to bore you all because not that our conversations are boring, but they're about us. I don't need to do that. I know I come from a different time. I come from a pre-phone time, a pre-cell phone time. Not saying it was better, not saying it was worse, it was different. I guess in my heart, to be honest, I feel it was better. I think setting boundaries with our phones is important for many reasons. I think. Studies have shown repeatedly, and we'll we'll pull some in on these things and talk about actual studies. I need to start doing that. I did that with the Benzo Free podcast, and I'll do it here. I like research. Um, research isn't absolute. Research can lie. We know this. It depends on who did the research, how well it was executed, um, where it's published. But it's I think the last thing we have that is still trying to use facts and science trying to back it so it's the best i believe it's the best resource we have to try to rely on but you have to know what you're reading who produced the research who created it and maybe even what their agenda might have been because most research honestly does have an agenda does have a bias even research that i teams that i've been on i will admit have a bias now i have tried to be absolutely as objective as I can with that research. But it doesn't mean there's not a bias in there. And being aware of that and trying to alleviate that is hard. It's I think it's what we have to do as a good researcher. Absolutely. But it doesn't always come out that way. And people have biases. This is what people do, but... Getting back to our core subject here, because I do ramble on. I think setting boundaries, especially with our phone, is really critical and really important. Learning to be away from our phone, even if the phone's on you, but you're just not looking at it. Or even if an alert comes through and you don't pick it up, it can start small. Most of the things we talk about on this podcast are not going to be things that you have to take huge steps for suddenly. That rarely works. I'm a big believer in starting small. Start with one step. And then take another. And see how that affects your life. Does it make it any better? A few of these changes are easy, but... Again, if we start small, we can get there. And setting boundaries, I think, is important. One of the boundaries I'm going to start setting is I'm going to stop doing these in bed, at least to a degree. 
I read an article on sleep and sleep hygiene and sleep, um, how to improve it and how to change things. And so one of those things was keep your bedroom and your bed for sleep. Keep screens out of it. And if you're not sleeping, then you're awake. Get up and do something. Do something else. But teach your body and your brain that the bed's for sleep. And I thought that was interesting and a, probably a healthy a healthy boundary for me to start to put in place. To try to get back to a normal sleep rhythm. I must admit the insomnia has gotten a little better. I am sleeping well, but I sleep about six hours and I wake up. And if I go to bed at nine, well then, or ten, I'm waking up at four. And that happens. So, here's the here's the takeaway for this. If you want a takeaway, and all these are just suggestions. And that is, take a look at how connected to your phone you are. Take a look at how much of your life you share online. And then really evaluate what that does to your life. Good and bad. How much you get out of that. Ask yourself, when I'm in different settings, taking a walk in nature, at a theme park, with my family, having dinner, how much are you there? How much are you in that moment? How often... Do you look at your phone? Sometimes the first step to making a change for the better is evaluating where you are now. I'll let you go. I should get up and get moving and get out of the bedroom because I'm no longer sleeping. Talk to you soon. Hey, this is Dee. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out our podcast. I do need to remind everyone that this podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical, psychological, or professional health advice of any kind. If you or someone you know is dealing with significant mental health issues, please seek professional help. Resources can be found in our show notes and on our website at unevenpodcast.com. Take care of yourself, and I'll catch you on the flip side.